Um, so yeah, as Sid said, uh, my name is John Weibel. Um, I have a lovely wife named Susie who's actually here tonight. My son and daughter, where are they at? Did they run off? Oh, very top. Where are they at? Well, they're up there somewhere playing. Um, Micah and Abigail, they are nine and seven years old, um, and we actually just adopted a little puppy. We named her Winnie, the Aussie Poo. Um, so she is a, a, a ball of energy, and we are picking up lots of pee and poop at our house. So it's a lot of fun. But um, I, like Sid said, I, I, am, I have been the past couple of years been able to step into the role of elder, and that has just been such a humbling experience. It's been such an amazing journey, and I'm I'm grateful um, that y'all invited me here tonight. It's an honor to be able to come in and talk with you guys. I love getting to see the faces of the young people. Y'all are just the life of our church, and it's so cool to see um, y'all in this stage of life. I, I, it's, a, it's especially cool for me and my wife because when we found the Vista, it was in 2005. Yeah, think about that. You know, right? I was a sophomore. Any sophomores in here at UMHB? No sophomores? One? There we go. You and me right? Um, we were sophomores and found this church that was meeting in a school that started a service at 1145. And I said, that's my church. <laughs> I'm going there. Um, but ever since I've been here and I've loved this church and it's just such an honor to be able to come in and, and just speak with you guys. So um, this <clears throat> series that has been uh, going through this Stranger Things series has been really cool to see. I was able to watch uh, the streams on them, and uh, I just wanted to real quick give a recap kind of of the past few weeks that y'all, uh, what y'all have been going over. So, of course, it's First Peter. We've been going through that. Um, Sid talked about how to handle trials and suffering, that we can mourn and rejoice at the same time. She also talked about being holy and getting our head in the game, and this means that we are set apart from our old life and we strive to draw closer to the nature of God. And a couple of weeks ago, y'all went through the Bible. Y'all, y'all talked about the Word of God and what it is and what it means and how this book is just such one big amazing story that can be used to nourish us and to transform us. You know, the, the, the milk, right? That we would long for that. And that is definitely something that um, is so transformative in our lives, is being able to look into God's Word, these letters that He's given us and says, hey, this is, this is who Christ is, and this is who you are to be like, you know, and it's just an incredible gift that God has given us. This week, we're actually going to be going through a thing uh, I titled it, Changing Our Perspective, Coming Alive in Christ So You Can Be Strange in This World. That's just kind of the theme, is that the world, you know, right, where they're going to look at us a little different if we do say things a certain way, right? And so we're just going to talk a little bit about our perspective, the, the lenses that we view the world through uh, today. So before I want to get into our text for this week, though, I wanted to kind of tag on to what Sydney talked about a couple of weeks ago with the Bible. You know, the people we read, I loved when she said, you know, these were real people, right? Like you and I, you know, they were just people that some of them were fishermen, some of them were tax collectors, some of them um, were tent makers. You you know, they were all walks of life, right? And, And God just came along and said, hey, follow me. And we are getting to see these stories play out in front of us. And I think it's just incredible to realize that like these were just real people like you and I. I mean, think about the fact that like he didn't pick judges. He didn't pick kings. He didn't pick rulers. He didn't pick wealthy politicians to be his people, right? No, he picked the ordinary, the regular people. They had, each of them had their own issues before Christ, and believe me, they had their issues even after following Christ. Um, I, I just, I love to think about those men and women when they, when they were following Jesus. They were walking the path with him, essentially, along the way, right? That's kind of the way they describe it. He would be going from place to place, right? And they're just watching this stuff happen. Like, can you imagine, like, leprosy is not something that we really see today, but, like, back then it was a big deal, and, like, you would be losing your skin, and, I mean, it was just a huge deal. If, if you got leprosy, you were put outside of the city walls, and you were an outcast. And Jesus would walk along and be like, oh, hey, there's a leper, and everybody's covering up, you know, COVID, putting the mask on, running the other way, right? But Jesus walks over and goes, no, like, I would, he would even go and touch them, which is just completely forbidden, right? And if you're, if you're that follower watching, you're just like, what is he doing, you know? And then all of a sudden, you just watch the skin get healed. Like, I just think about that, and I go, that must have been cool, you know? Like, just to be there and imagine that, you know, watching someone who's never walked before just stand up and walk. Like, a lot of times we hear these stories, and we're just like, oh, that's cool. But like, no, like, what if you were there and that happened? You would just be like, what is happening? You know, a kid walks up with 
bread and fish and we feed 5,000 people. We, we just ate some spaghetti and lasagna, right? And that fed 100 of us. Think about that, 5,000. And that was the men, most likely women and children. There's probably 15,000 with two bread, piece of bread and some fish, right? Those are just cool things to think about, like what Christ was doing. Well, I think it would have been a lot of fun to follow Christ and to see that happening until you did something stupid, like a lot of the disciples did, because you might end up with a nickname. If any of y'all, have y'all watched the show Chosen? Several of you, I'm assuming. So if you haven't seen it, it is incredible, just a gift, honestly, to us to, to be able to see and, and put just images and, and pictures in front of us of like, oh, that's what it was like, you know, and it helps to really see it. So anyways, this is one of my favorite scenes. I wanted to put it up there because it just cracks me up every time. So nickname. Uh-oh. I'm going to narrate. <laughs> Jesus says, oh boy, well, we can skip it. Um, so that scene, does anybody remember that scene? Yes, you do. What happens? You remember? Uh, wasn't there something leading up to it? Yeah, well, they walk, the, some, some Samaritans walk by, right? They throw some rocks at them, and they're like, get out of here, you Jewish dogs, and they throw a rock at them, right? And James and John, those are the two guys, they get all like, all right, let's go. We're going to throw down, you know? And Jesus is like, no, 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 that's not why we're here, right? And then James and John, they're like, they walk off, and he's, they're like, you're just going to let them like spit on you and throw rocks at you? And he's like, yeah, and like we should do something. He's like, what's that going to accomplish? And they're like, <laughs> I just love this part. They go, we should rain fire down on them. We should bring lightning and just smoke them, you know? And Jesus is just like, fire, really? And they were like, oh, you know, and Jesus talks about how like, oh, like, that's not what I came for, right? You know, and he, I just love the scene because at the end he turns around, he grabs both of them you know, after kind of admonishing them and saying like, no, we're not going to use the power of God to burn people up like that. And he grabs them and he's like, y'all are just so passionate. I love it. You know, fire, thunder. You know what? I've got a nickname for y'all. So if you look in Mark 3.17, uh, there's the nickname. The sons of Zebedee, James and John, are known as the sons of thunder. Isn't that awesome that Jesus gave, <laughs> gave them a nickname, the sons of thunder? Anyways, if that wasn't bad enough, then same two yahoos, they went, and on the way to, uh, when they were walking to Jerusalem, this is my favorite part, too, of, the, of one of the stories that Matthew, I love that Matthew would have written this down. He's the only one that recorded this version of it. So we got it up on the screen, I believe. It says, then the mother of Zebedee's sons, the sons of thunder, came to Jesus. So this is their mother, said Jesus and with her sons, and she kneel, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, Jesus, asked, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink from the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right and to my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom have been prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with their two brothers. So that's what I love is like, Matthew could have stopped there, but Matthew was like, no, 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 no. I was a part of the 10. And when we saw that happen, we were like, you brought your mom to ask Jesus to give you the seat of honor. Like, can you imagine the ribbing afterwards when Jesus was like, no, you can't have that, you know? And they're just like, oh, yeah, you, you, you want to get your mom to ask Jesus for, you know, uh, heal your ankle or something, you know? Anyway, sorry, I'm a dad. I do jet dad jokes. Y'all just got to be okay with that. Um, so that was James and John. I just love that the Bible becomes more real, that Jesus gave nicknames to people. I see that, and I go, man, that is just so cool, that Jesus was a person too, right? That he had a sense of humor, that he was involved in, in his followers' lives. But we need to move on. I want to talk about, of course, Simon, right? Simon is the person who wrote the letter we've been going through. His name was Simon, right? That's how he started, and then Jesus gave him a nickname. And so here's my dad joke. You ready? So does anybody know what Peter means? In Greek, Petros, rock. I heard it. That's right. Right? So Peter means rock. You probably already know the story. But I think there was another story when God gave Peter the name of rock. Right? So Peter was a fisherman. Everybody knows that. He was a fisherman. Day by night, he'd be out there fishing. He's on the, the, the lake. You know, obviously, he would probably could be able to swim. He's probably getting in the water, fixing nets, all that kind of stuff. Right? Well, Jesus comes walking on the water. What happens? Peter's like, can I come? And 
And I was like, yeah, come on. Steps out the boat, starts walking on the water, right? I mean, that's crazy enough. But then the crazy part to me is that why would Peter doubt? Now, I get it. If he like stepped out and just like sank, sure. I'd be like, okay. But he's walking. And all of a sudden he sees a wave. And he's like, uh, okay, I'm out. And he sinks, right? Super fast. And then Christ, he cries out. Grab, God grabs him, throws him in the boat, says, oh, you little faith. And I like to think that he might have gone, oh, you little faith. Your new name is now Rock because you sank like a rock. I got a couple chuckles. All right, fine. Dad joke. But no, that's not where it is, right? In Matthew, um, let's see, 16. This is where most scholars believe that Peter got that name, right? So we can see that Simon Peter answered. This is after Jesus asked, who do people say I am, right? And some people gave some answers, Elijah stuff. Then Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the Son of of the living God, right? And then Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven, right? And I tell you that you are Peter. You are the rock on, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That's where most scholars think that kind of happened. It's just another, such a cool story to see Jesus giving people names. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and get into our passage for today. Um, Y'all are going to be reading and kind of discussing it, this first part. Um, So we're going to be talking through 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. I'm going to go ahead and um, read it for us, and then y'all are going to kind of discuss. I'll put some questions up there. Um, But I I, I do want you to kind of think, so you know his nickname now, right? And as we read through this, I don't know, I, I could see Peter as he's like writing this, going, what, what, uh symbolism should I use? What, what analogy? Oh, I've got a good one, right? Okay, so here we go. First Peter 2, 4 through 10. And coming to him as to a living stone, which was rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for the unbelievers, a stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this they were also appointed." But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim his ex- excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. So I just want y'all, we'll kind of leave that if you can. We, we might scroll back through. But if y'all have your Bible, several of you do. So you can probably reread through it. I know it was a lot um, as you discuss. But I want y'all to answer kind of these questions. These are, these are ones that we can just kind of go through that scripture. And I want you to think about what are we according to Peter? And how would the readers of that day, remember this is back in the first century, right? How would the readers of that day, um, how would they have received being told what they are? And then how should we, 2,000 years later, how should we receive what Peter is telling us that we are? So y'all go ahead and discuss that among your tables. (laughs) Test, test. All right. So now that y'all have gotten to discuss, does anybody want to throw some thoughts out there? Hey guys. Oh, geez, loud. Um, Okay, so at our table, we kind of talked about uh, verse 9, and we kind of like took that. I feel like a lot of Christians can kind of take it and be prideful, but I feel like the verse is calling us to, oh, sorry, is calling us to like knowledge what we're like privileged with and like knowledge what we need to be holding like as responsibility. Yeah, I don't know if I worded that correctly. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. That is, 
definitely I'm going to be going through each one of those, and for sure that is a huge part of the meat of that, that verse and what those mean for sure. And it is a weighty responsibility. Anybody else? What, what about question two specifically? Anyone want to share their thoughts on what do you think the original audience would have thought, especially in light of our conversation so far? Um, so we really talked about how um, it's talking about like the cornerstones and like obviously you're going to be aware of like the building because it's like back in the day when they did a lot of building and stuff. And so they probably recognize the significance of the cornerstone. But um, us in this day and age, we have the ability and like um, honor of being able to look back and be like, oh, this is how Jesus was like built on and how he really is like the cornerstone of all time. And we're just kind of used as like people to like strengthen the foundation in our like respective communities. But like Jesus had just been around, like he had just left like fairly recently. And so they didn't really have that like thought process and so they probably were kind of like dude what is this guy talking about like with rocks Why and he like talking about rocks and so <laughs> i i just think that we definitely see it in a different way than they probably would have just because we have a lot more perspective anybody else So I'm going to go through a couple of the highlight ones, which we definitely have talked about, um, and just help us help us kind of answer that last question. What, what does this mean for us? And it's going to be a lot of what we, what we just said, but kind of go into the really cool parts of it and, and see what we can pull out of it and learn from it. So in the first part of the verse, um, you see that it says, and coming to him, right? That, that word, that's an ongoing verb. Like that's saying, yeah, that's gonna, this is going to keep happening. So it says, and coming to him, as to the living stone. So that, that reference was actually Peter pointing back to the Old Testament. Um, there was a story in the Old Testament of the Israelites. They were out wandering in the desert. They seemed to do that a lot, right? They're out there wandering. Moses is with them. They're running out of water. And that, so they get a group of people together and they go and they go, hey, we're, we're dying. Our, our, our livestock's dying. We're going to be dying if we don't get water soon. So Moses goes before God and God says, all right, look, Go to this rock specifically, and I want you to speak to the rock, and I will provide living water, right? So it was a, an ode to what Jesus was going to be for us. This is um, what Peter is trying to say. He says, and coming to him. So it would be like us going to get a drink of water. We need that, right? Every day we're needing to drink water. Um, so it's us as us coming to him as to a living stone, which was rejected by people, but is the choice and precious in the sight of God. He then goes on to call us living stones, right? So there's another story of Christ talking about very similar things. This is um, the woman at the well. I don't know if y'all know that story, but there's a story where they were in Samaria. Jesus was sitting there and a woman came out in the middle of the day to, to draw water from a well. And Jesus asked her for a drink. And she's like, oh, okay, fine. She gives him a drink. But then while she is doing that, um, he's talking to her about the water, right? And she says, uh, this is in John 4, 13, he says, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life, right? So that's another, just another thing tying that together, you know, that Jesus would have taught about, right? And so that was another thing that was just cool to think about. And then when we are called living stones, it's a weird, like, right, the stones are not alive, right? It's, it's a weird wording for us. But I heard some people over here saying it, um, and then, of course, the connecting to the cornerstone. That is something that, back in that day, the architecture of the day, any architect and any mason would go and they would pick out a very specific stone. They would know what building they're going to want to make. They're going to know the height. They're going to know what they're going for. But they would go for one stone very specifically. They would pick it out. The mason would take a lot of time getting in there. They would get it through the perfect height. They would get it perfectly leveled. They would get it at the perfect angle because if they needed that line to be straight, the wall all the way through, and they were off by half of a degree here, 
the whole wall in the end would be off by hundreds of feet. And so they would take that time to get this cornerstone correct. Okay, and so what's happening here, though, is, is so cool. You know, if you, you think about it, these living stones, well, that's saying, okay, wait a minute, it's alive, so it needs sustenance. Where is it connected? Where would each of us, because we are the living stones, right? What are we connected to? Well, in the end, we are connected to that cornerstone, that life that, give, that gives us the ability to move on. That is through Christ Jesus, who is that cornerstone. Another uh, example of this would have been when Christ was teaching in a parable in John uh, 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So something that I, I would like to point out is, you know, this living stone thing, right? If it was a living stone, and it was cast out, or it's sitting on the road, or it's sitting off in a field, is it doing anything? Right? No, it, it, is, it would be useless. But what God is saying here is he's saying, look, you are a living stone. You're a piece of this incredible thing that I am building. And that thing that he is building is actually a rebuilding of the temple. Okay, so that is another th- imagery of he's saying, hey, look, y'all are going to be the temple. The temple was this place that was very sacred. It's where God's um, presence was for the Israelites, right? So there was a very sacred place. One person could go in there one time a year, and if they had had any blemish or any sin that they had not covered, drop dead. Like they were, it was a very sacred place. The high priest was the only one allowed to go into it. So this is another analogy of saying, hey, like, look, we are actually now a part of that temple. Why? Because when Christ came and he died and he took sin, he actually gave us the ability to be that temple, right? Where we are now a part of that because Christ is in us, right? So you are not sitting there and you're not out on your own. The point is you would be a living stone connected to the body of Christ, to his church, right, to the temple that is being rebuilt. And so we, each of us in here that has accepted Christ and said, yeah, he is my Lord, you are now part of that temple being rebuilt from thousands of years ago. And I just think that is so cool and such good imagery for us to remember. And and the thing to think about is that we need community. That doesn't mean that we're one stone connected to the cornerstone. No, we're way down the line, right? We're thousands of years down the line. But we are being built into this and beautiful, immaculate building that is the temple of God, right? And, and we need to be connected to community, to other stones around us. And so that is why it's so important that you get connected and you remain connected to others who can help to build you up. You know, it's another thing in the verse, if you read, it says that you are being built up. This is a part of verse five. It says, you are living stones are being built up. Well, what does that mean? That's another one of those verbs. It's ongoing, right? So a mason wouldn't just grab a brick or a stone and go, okay, yeah, that's good, and just toss it wherever. No, he would look at it and he would say, okay, no, I need this one to be chipped away. I need it to be this long and I need to cut off of it, right? That is what's happening to us. We're being sanctified, right? Y'all are in your early 20s or right around there and you're, you are in a place where you're being sanctified. You're going to grow. I, I lost my grandfather. Um, he was 94. It was about five years ago. And that man lived a life that was just he always talked about being sanctified, always talked about live for Jesus, always talked about that. And it was just, it's cool to kind of see that perspective that he was still being sanctified every day at 94 years old, right? He would still read God's word. He would still get in community. He would still submit himself to the loving admonishment of other believers in Christ. And so that is just cool to see that imagery put in place there. What else are we called? We're called a royal priesthood. This is another thing that kind of beckons back to the Old Testament, right? The priesthood. That was the Levites, you know? So we live in a very, um, a culture that's fiercely individualistic, right? And it's self-infatuated. We see it all over the culture. Postmodernism, which is just the, the spirit of this age that says, you know, your truth. You probably obviously have heard that quite a bit, right? Um, Don't submit yourself to others. You do what makes you happy. You do what you want to do. You be you, right? That's kind of the spirit of the age that we live in. And, you know, the response that, that I think God wants us to have is, no, guys, don't be who you want to be. Be who I say you are. You are a royal priesthood. 
What does that mean, right? Well, the Levites, they were back in the Old Testament in Numbers 8. You could see where God called them out. He separated them from the Israelites and gave them specific jobs dealing with the temple. He said, you are to be uh, cleansed. You just shave all the hair off your body. Think about that task. And to go in so that you can set up and put all the things um, in the temple the right way and have it all done. And then you are then there to help um, the Israelites atone for their sins. They had to pay sacrifices and give offerings to the Lord. And that's what the Levites were set aside for. Right? Well, we just got called that, a royal priesthood. So how does that apply to us today? Right? Well, today, since Jesus atoned for all of our sin, past, present, and future, we no longer need priests, right? Because Christ is in us. So since we are now the temple, we are that church, we have to realize that this building, this is not the Vista Community Church. It's where we meet, sure, for a lot of things. But you, you are the Vista Community Church. And when you go out into this world, you are to be that, right? That royal priesthood. What does that mean? Well, a priest, you know, that was someone who kind of did certain things. But we just got called that. So maybe how do we relate it to today? I would say that each one of us in here is a pastor, right? We like to label Austin and Dave and Sydney as pastors. And that's true. They have a vocational job. But I, I don't think that exempts all of us um, from going out and pastoring the people who God has put in our lives, our friends, family, co-workers, classmates, teammates, right? We are called to be that royal priesthood. We are set apart to be sanctified and are being sanctified We are this priesthood, a bunch of pastors going out into a hurting and confused world, and we are armed with the truth, okay? Not a truth, we are armed with the truth, that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins, and he saves us. And that's what we go out into this world armed with, right? And we are pastors. Um, So the next thing was um, a holy nation, right? That's another one. That word nation translated into Greek is actually the word ethnos, which is where we in the English language get the word ethnicity, right? Well, holy ethnicity, what does that mean? You know, we, what, is, what, is, what is Peter trying to say here? Well, that is him calling us to say, hey, look, whereas before this was for the Israelites and this was set aside, no, Christ has come so that all, and you are now all a holy uh, ethnicity, a holy nation. We are united under our Savior. We're united across all walks of life. By calling us a holy nation, God is taking away all the things that throughout human history has divided us, right? Like, think about all the things. If you think of all the wars and all the things that have divided us, it's usually along those lines, right? Something to do with where you live or the ethnicity you have or the status you have in in society, right? Well, this holy nation is a beckoning to us to say, no, I, I am calling my people to be different. No matter your background, as men and women of Christ, we are to be united across cultural, across socioeconomic, across ethnic lines. We get to cross those boundaries. You know what's so cool is we get to cross those boundaries because we have something to offer. A lot of times it's like, no, I don't, I don't want to talk to anybody different than me. Well, no, we, the holy nation, get to take the gospel of Christ across the world. Right? And that is such a, an awesome privilege. I heard y'all say that earlier. It's a privilege right, that we get to carry. We get to be ambassadors for Christ. Uh, the, the last thing Christ said to his followers, Acts 1.8. You've probably heard this verse before. This is right before he ascends into heaven. He says, you, and he's speaking, and I believe he is speaking to the people standing there, but I think he looked through time and space, and he stared straight at every one of us. And he said, you are going to be my witnesses. Okay, you are going to be a part of my holy church. You're going to be a brick, a living stone in that. And you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the, uh, the word that my Bible says, remotest part of the earth. Like it's just saying, you're going to go out and I need you to be that holy nation as you do it. So now that we understand kind of what Peter was saying in these verses and and saying who we are, what I want to finish our time with is talking about how our perspective can change. So our perspective is the lenses that each one of us sees this world through, right? We all have different perspectives. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different way we were raised. We all have different experiences in life. 
we all have different perspectives, but I, what I hope here is that we can all at least gain some, a little bit of a, a same perspective that we can get and be able to become more united through. So how does Peter answer this, this question of now that we have this perspective, what can we make, what decisions can we make that, that we can change in our lives? And I think in verse 5 and in verse 9, you all talked about it. Peter says, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. And then he also says, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. God calls us to live lives that proclaim his goodness. That's, that's, when it comes down to it, that's what he's saying. Guys, I am calling you to live a life that proclaims my goodness. Be living stones. That is a lifelong calling. Think about that. That is a building that is being built, and it's been being built for thousands of years. And we, as we be these living stones, will pass that on to the next generation of Christ followers, right? That is a lifelong calling. Being a royal priesthood, that is a lifelong calling. You don't get to stop being a pastor because you get to retire at 65, right? No, like my grandfather, 94, every time you would go see him, he would want to talk to you about Jesus. And I'm his grandkid. I'm like, Grandpa, we've talked about this before. But no, that's who he was, right? He was a part of that royal priesthood. Be a part of that holy nation. That is a lifelong calling. These callings are going to be what define our lives, right? Paul, he sums this up in 2 Timothy 4, 5 through 7. I think it's going to be on the screen. This is Paul towards the end of his ministry. And he's saying to To Timothy, he says, and to honestly, and to all of us, he said, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering. Y'all talked about that recently, right? Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry, for I am being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. What a beautiful thing to be able to say at the end of your life, right? That you look back on these things and you said, I was a part of that royal priesthood. I was a part of that living stone. And I was a part of that holy nation, right? So uh, this is where I wanted to talk to you real quick about my walk with Christ. Um, I'm 37, about to be 38 years old. And about 12 years ago, so in my mid-20s is when this all started to really start making more sense to me. I spent a lot of time going to groups like this. I I started listening to a lot of sermons and it started to really click like, oh, wait a minute. Like I'm, I'm 25 years old. I'm a quarter of the way to a hundred, right? Like it, it goes by quick. And I started realizing who am I going to be? Like, let's, let's be real. You know, this is my parents' religion, my grandpa's religion. Who am I going to be? in this life? Do, am I going to be a royal priesthood? Am I going to be a holy nation? Am I going to be a living stone? And this has all started to kind of really gnaw at me a little bit. And I had to finally come to that realization that I think my perspective was off. And so I, I want to kind of talk to us, uh, kind of give us some examples. Um, you know, so I would, we all make choices. We, we see the world through a lens, right? So as a kid, you obeyed your mom and dad. Why? When you went to school, when you were in grade school, you obeyed the rules. Why? All right. In college, you study hard, you show up to classes. Why? Once you're out of college, you're going to get a job. You're going to work at that job. You're going to show up. Why? When I got married, I chose, I wanted to honor my wife and I wanted to care for my wife. Why? Like, why are those things that, that I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. That's, why are those things that y'all do or have done? Well, for me, earlier in my 20s, it was definitely I would have answered that question of why. I would have said, well, I guess the fear of punishment, right? Like, I, as a kid, I didn't want to get punished. You know, I tried to do what's right. I didn't want to get grounded. You know, I didn't want to lose privileges. Or maybe in school, I didn't want to get sent to the principal's office. You know, nobody wants to be that guy, right? You know, or... Maybe when we got to college, it might have been more, maybe not as much punishment, because, right, nobody's getting punished now, but it was more shifted to me for the approval of men, right? Like, I wanted to be known as, like, okay, well, you know, I want to be a good student, or I want to be a good basketball player, I want to be, all these things in my life were for the approval of man. And I, I, I would say that's how I viewed it. And then I came to realize that I had it all wrong, that perspective 
was just off, right? The wording I use for this perspective shift with my, my wife and anybody in my community has heard me say so many times, but the wording I use is out of a right relationship with Christ, okay? And then I can fill in that blank. You can put that in anything and fill in the blank, okay? So out of a right relationship with Christ comes me honoring and caring for my wife. Out of the overflow of the decisions of that, of me saying, I'm going to honor and care for my wife because it is what God has asked me to do, that is where then the overflow of that is that I would have a healthy marriage, right? I didn't choose to treat my wife well because I wanted a healthy marriage. No, I strive to love my wife well with everything I have because I want to honor God because that is what he has called me to, right? And then out of that overflow comes beauty, Great. And that's where I started to kind of grasp it, where as before I wanted to be a good husband for the approval of my wife or the approval of my dad or the approval of my brother or people who knew me. And, oh, John, you're such a good husband. Like that was where my motivation came from. But now I started to shift and I started to go, no, like, no, that is wrong. That is the wrong way to see things. Out of a decision of going, I want to honor God. That's why I do things. Out of a right relationship with God can come you all choosing to be a good roommate, choosing to be an excellent student, choosing to be a faithful friend, choosing to be a loving coworker. And out of the overflow of honoring God by being all those things comes peace in your apartment because you've learned how to handle conflict in God's way, right? Comes um, a diploma, You know, you go through school, you work hard. Why? Not to get your diploma. That's not why you're going to school. You're going to school because you want to honor God. God has given you this opportunity to expand your knowledge, right? To learn something, to be good at something. Use that and say, I'm doing it because I want to honor God. And then guess what happens? You end up getting a diploma, right? And you can say, I got that to honor God, right? Long, lifelong, deep friendships, Because you chose to do nothing from emptiness or selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, you regarded one another as more important than yourself. Why? Because that's what God told you to do. He said in Philippians 2, 3, that. He said, go do that. Honor me in that and watch what happens. That's how you can end up with good relationships with people as you would treat them the way that God has called us to. You can get satisfaction at work. You can get raises. You can get new opportunities because you choose to honor God. In Colossians 3.23, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So it might sound like I'm saying if you do these things, good things happen. We do not believe in the prosperity gospel here. Like That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when you choose to honor God in every decision you make, you are going to be doing what God has called you to do. And out of that comes the blessings of God, right? It's not a guarantee. In fact, <laughs> let's read. You know, I was going to say, y'all may be thinking, well, what happens when it doesn't go well? What happens when I get an F on a paper, you know, right? Well, I would just say... The answer to that, it's a wise question. It's a really good question to to navigate. Like, think about it. You've got to wrestle with that. I still wrestle with it today at 37, 38 years old. It's a tough question. But I, I can just say that my answer is this, that God does not promise us ease. He does not promise us wealth. He does not promise us fame or power. Those are the things of this world. In fact, John 16, 33, he says, I've said these things to you that you may have peace. In this world, you will have troubles. That's, that's a tough thing to hear, right? That's Jesus. That's the cornerstone. He's looking through time and space and he's going, you will have troubles, right? But take heart because I have overcome the world. So I would just say in response to that, like none of what the world is offering will ever satisfy us. It just isn't. It won't. It never has and it never will. The abundant life that I'm talking about, that Christ speaks of, is for those of us who have chosen in good times and in bad, in stressful times and in peaceful times, to honor him with their choices and to continually praise him 
for his goodness, no matter the circumstance. Okay, that's, that's the perspective shift that I'm hoping that we can gain today. When you leave this building, I hope that, you know, you don't remember really anything I said, but what I hope that you would do is that, that churning inside of you to go, why do I do things? You know, is it for my glory? Is it for the approval of a man? Is it to avoid the bad things? And I would just challenge you to think about it and go, okay, what, what if that decision I could choose to, to honor God? That be my motivation, right? And you can apply that, like I said, to anything. Out of the overflow of a right relationship with God comes, and you just fill in that blank, okay? And so real quick, I want to go through the questions. I know we're running short on time. I've got a few questions for you all. Um, and these are a little bit more in-depth that you all can go through. Um, I think we'll just throw them on the screen. Y'all can just discuss them. I don't need to read through them. So go ahead and discuss those and we'll come back. All right. Does anyone, anybody want to share what y'all talked about? We spend a lot of time just like generally talking. I feel like a lot of our table deals with like the same things that have gotten in the way and a lot of it's like the pleasing of man and like the pleasing of others. I know a couple of us were like, oh, well, we've said this thing like or we've done this decision and like chosen this major to like please family when like if it and it goes into question too, like if we were pleasing the Lord and like we're led in that direction, like it shouldn't matter. And that like the strife and the stress will all like be worth it if we're like tunnel visioned on the Lord and like that's all that should matter yeah um one of the things that we talked about is that um when we decide to honor the Lord in everything we do we start to realize how temporary this life is um and we get to see like what really matters and what we put in our life that really doesn't matter um, and it kind of gives us an urgency of just like what John said, like being a priest and a pastor to the people around us that aren't saved. Um, cause like I said, like this life is very temporary. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that need us. Well, I do want to end with just kind of an encouragement. That last one, uh, I put that one in there specifically because I want you guys, uh, I can speak to myself and my, my wife, that one of the greatest changes that we've ever had in our life was joining a small group that was intentional to be accountable. Um, I know that it's y'all are in a different season of life. It's difficult. You got lots of changes, changing roommates, changing things. But I do just want to encourage you guys, like, Figure out a way to get surrounded by some people that you know are connected to that cornerstone that you can trust and that you can then do that. You can sit there and go, okay, how, how can I actually be held accountable to some of this stuff? It's great to talk about it, and genuinely it is. It's great to think about those things, but I would just say if you want to actually see change happen, um, you, you will hear it said uh, here all the time, and if you haven't heard it said, you will soon, that we believe that, that God changes our hearts in the context of community and over time. You're not just going to wake up one day and go, oh yeah, I got it. All right, God, you know, his will, and, and I'm going to just focus on him. Like, no, it, it, it's a process. That living stone, you're still going to need to be chipped away at, right? And that happens in the context of other men and women who believe the same things. Surround yourself with those, okay? Um, so I would just say, I want to encourage you. Sorry, that was from the heart. I actually wrote something down. <laughs> I encourage you all, um, and I just want to spur you on. Being here tonight, committing to a regular gathering and submitting yourself to the loving admonishment of others is a huge step in your faith walk. Being willing to live a life connected to other living stones is, prime, is a primary way that Christ is going to show up more in your life. Being to connected to other living stones that truly are connected to the living stone. Being a part of that royal priesthood. Living a life of a pastor. Go out and minister to the hurt and the lost. 
Be a holy nation. Break down barriers. Love everyone the way that Christ loves them. And lastly, out of the knowledge that you are loved by God, you are his own people, change your perspective. Teach yourself to make choices out of a right understanding of who Jesus is and how the choices you are about to make can honor him and proclaim his excellencies because that's what Peter is trying to tell us here, right? Come alive in Christ so that we can go out and be strange in this world and live lives that honor Jesus. I'm going to pray for us. God, we just pause and stand in awe of you. We stand in awe of the grace that you have shown us in Jesus. We ask that as we leave this building, that we would remember that it is not the church. That we would remember that we are living stones connected and built upon your precious cornerstone. Help us as we head back to our respective lives to be men and women that are continually marked as a holy nation that is proclaiming your excellencies to a watching world. God, help us to learn each day how we can change our perspective. We can make each decision out of a deep and abiding understanding that you are good and that everything you do is good. Help us to honor your goodness with the choices we make in our time here on this earth. We thank you for the gift of this life, and we thank you for the gift of your son. In Jesus' name, amen.